This session about micro M&A, this idea of buying businesses for growth, buying businesses as opposed uh, to starting them uh, from scratch, is a topic that never in a billion years would have been on a traffic and conversion summit stage had I not met Roland Frazier. Uh, Roland Frazier uh, is my business partner. Uh, but prior to that, Roland, I, I met Roland because he came to uh, the second, you didn't make it to the first TNC, but you were at the second TNC, correct? Don't know. Don't know. Nobody can know. It was too long ago. Uh, he was at the second Traffic Conversion Summit, and at that event, he signed up for our uh, mastermind group uh, called War Room. And Roland joined War Room, and at the time, the group was only 15 or 20 people, and... The way that we did these mastermind sessions is the first half of it, people would ask for help, and then the second half, um, people would give their best ideas. Well, Roland never asked for help. Roland just kind of sat there quietly and took notes for everybody. And then when it came time uh, to give his suggestion, what we call Wicked Smart, which we now duplicate at Traffic and at, at Traffic Convergence Summit, uh, we got a Wicked Smart session tomorrow, Roland would deliver the most amazingly incredible wicked smart ideas and just win this contest every dang time. He just won it again and again to the point where it's like, stop it. You're making everybody feel bad. Um, and after a certain amount of time, I was like, man, what do you do? Because I didn't even really know what his business was. He'd be like, oh, you know, I've got this company over here and this company over here and this one over here. I was like, how? How do you have time to start? I was like, no, no, start them. I, I buy them. You should be buying businesses too. I think it's crazy. You guys know how to market, you know, all these different businesses. You basically, you know, start them from scratch, wait till they get to a certain point, and then you deploy your growth stuff. You know, you could skip that whole start it from scratch, buy something that isn't quite, you know, there yet, and just start working on it day one. You should do that. And I was like, that's a great idea. I don't know how to do any of that. Why don't we become business partners? And that's exactly what happened. Um, and, you know, here we are nearly a decade later, a number of... Uh, a number of really good acquisitions under our belts, a number of, a couple of maybe that weren't as good that were in general almost always my idea, uh, by the way. And I truly believe as I stand here today, uh, the ability to acquire companies, assets, media is going to be the biggest strategic advantage that we can have as small business owners. This is a, uh, you know, a, a concept and a topic that really didn't wasn't available uh, down market where we are. It just didn't happen. The concept of micro M&A didn't exist. M&A, mergers and acquisitions, happened at the top end of the business ecosystem. And now we're seeing a lot more of these happen. I truly believe it's the biggest opportunity um, of growth for you, uh, just as I've seen it be one of the biggest opportunities uh, of growth for us. So we're not really talking about marketing, but we kind of are talking about marketing. We're not really talking about, um, you know, the, the, the tactical aspects of it, but what does it look like to buy the tactics as opposed to learning it? So truly, truly, you've made a smart uh, decision to trudge all the way down here and to be in this room. Uh, and so with that said, I'm gonna shut up. Please welcome to the stage, my good friend and business partner, Mr. Roland Frazier. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm, I, I, here. COVID, this is COVID friendly. Yeah, all right. <laughs> well, thank you guys for, uh, for making it up here. Ryan told me it was like 100 degrees in here earlier, so uh, it, it, they've obviously fixed yeah, that. Welcome. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, but I, I just, this is basically something that um, I've been doing for a long, long time, longer than I'd care to admit. And um, it's ridiculously effective. And so um, to me, it's kind of whatever it is that you're looking for, M&A, which is mergers and acquisitions, has the answer for that. And um, let me see if, uh, if I can make it, uh, there we go. Um, whatever it is that you're looking. So if you're looking for more customers, then you can acquire. And when we say, I like acquire better than buy because um, a lot of times we don't really pay anything for these companies. We don't pay anything out of pocket, that is. We have um, helped people do deals like this up to $89 million. Um, we had somebody that acquired a no-money deal with $20 million of profit um, just at the end of, uh, of last year, and now they're in the process of going public. So this works even in the you know, in the field of the bigger people that are playing in M&A. But you can acquire customers. 
So if you want more customers, you can acquire competitors, right? If you are looking for um, more leads, if you want to have more sales, and you want more leads, then you can acquire media, and the media can feed the leads. The, the idea here is that we're finding people who've already aggregated the attention and eyeballs of our ideal customer profile. If you want to be able to have a greater capacity to handle the people that are coming in and buying stuff from you, you can do that. We've acquired across a whole bunch of different companies from sales teams to dev teams, you name it. If you're looking to increase your average order value, you can run all kinds of split tests, but if you look at how much those typically move the needle and how long they move the needle versus an actual acquisition of another product or service, it's almost inconsequential because we're fighting for tactics and we're fighting for a hack. And whenever everybody else comes to TNC and learns those hacks, then they go away, right? But that's not the case if you acquire a product. And these can be assets that you acquire, by the way, or complete companies. It doesn't matter. So you can increase your average order value. If you want to increase your lifetime customer value, then rather than figuring out how to create something that has recurring revenue, you can simply buy something that fits with something that you've already got that adds recurring revenue. So we'll talk a little bit about that. If you are saying, well, right now, everything is cool, except I'm not making enough money. Ad costs, acquisition costs have gone up because of all these privacy changes, and so I can't make enough money. Well, you can acquire up and down your supply and distribution chain and make more margin, right? Now, a lot of people think that this only applies when you are acquiring, like if I'm a, a product seller and I go and acquire my manufacturer. But maybe you are acquiring content from somebody else. Maybe you have somebody doing your media buying for you, uh, and it would be good to acquire them. Maybe there's an affiliate that's responsible for some significant income for you that you're paying a 50, 60% commission that you could simply acquire and not have to do that anymore, right? So if you can do that without having to come out of pocket any money, cash is not a constraint. And cash not being a constraint means anything is possible. You can acquire really anything. You just have to know where to look. And then last but not least, this is a little bit zoomed in. You guys, uh, I don't even know if there's anybody back there, but uh, I can't really see this. Uh, is intellectual property. So if you're looking to innovate, if you want to get new stuff and be on the cutting edge of anything, and you don't have a research and development department, then intellectual property acquisitions can be a wonderful thing to do too, okay? All of this stuff helps grow your business. So this is kind of a unique time that we're in. Um, we've had a lot of, uh, it seems like we don't have anybody that's standing still in our portfolio. We either have people that got um, hit initially by all of the challenges with COVID and then recovered, or we have, uh, we have people who um, just the business took off like crazy. But no matter what, it's the best time. There's an interesting thing that's going on in taxes in the United States. So for everybody here from the United States, they're talking about eliminating capital gains taxes. So what you have is a whole bunch of people that are thinking they're gonna pay twice as much in taxes a year from now or two years from now, depending on when the government can get its act together, which I assume is gonna be any day, right? Because government's historically, you know, <laughs> they know what they're doing, right? They're efficient. Uh, but the capital gains tax going away is causing a lot of people who might not otherwise want to sell to sell faster at lower prices because even with a 10% discount, they're still gonna be 10% ahead. Okay, so that's kind of a cool thing. That was from the uh, CEO of Blackstone, by the way, which is the company that owns the company that acquired this event from us uh, a couple of years back. So there's three things that are going on that are kind of conspiring to make these opportunities really, really good. The first is that baby boomers are aging out. A lot of baby boomers now don't want to continue to be in the business that they were in before. There's a lot of other reasons, but just the fact that they're getting older. You, you ultimately exit a business at some point somehow right? Even if that's, you just croak. So um, they have to exit their businesses. There are quite a few of them, 50 million baby boomers that are going to be retiring over the next 10 years, and about 12 million of those own businesses. So we're seeing about four and a half million businesses per year over the next 10 years that will be transitioning, Okay, and some will transition and retransition if you're trying to reconcile the math there. That's where those stats come from. The second is that there is an overcapacity right now on the market. 
everything in the world seems to be going up right now at a crazy clip. Everything that, that I want to buy, apparently, is, is more expensive now than it was like a year ago. Um, we went to get a, uh, a, a $300 bottle of bourbon for Richard Lindner, our business partner, for his birthday. The last time I looked, two years or so ago, it was $300. It's $1,700 now. I had dinner last night with uh, Tucker Max, who's a, a, a friend of ours, and he told me he just sold his house for two and a half times more than he paid for it like three years later. Two and a half times, not 25%. So everything is more expensive um, because the supply and demand. Blackstone bought, I think it was, spent $18 billion to buy a bunch of houses recently because they said that there's about a five point, I think it's 5.8 million house shortage right now that the world is facing because after 2007, 8, 9, everybody was like, I ain't building no houses. We got plenty of houses, I'm not building those anymore. So we didn't do it for the longest time. And now we don't have enough, so supply and demand. So on the opposite side of that is what, where we're sitting right now with businesses. Because there is a crazy oversupply of businesses and not enough demand and not an organized market to sell them. There are sites that you can go to and list your business, and then there are investment bankers and business brokers that you can go to, but no matter which of those sources you use, only about 20% of the businesses that get listed for sale, the people who have decided they want to do this and hired a professional, only about 20% of those sell, meaning 80% don't. So there's this huge oversupply in this fragmented market. Good opportunity, supply and demand. And then there's a whole bunch of people that are just like, you know, I know it's a real pain in the butt to sell the business, so I don't want to go through the process, or I don't know how. And so they just close them. They just close them, right? Every year, there's six and a half million startups, and 1.6 million of those fail. That's a lot, right? So if you compare the acquisition versus the startup world, because a lot of startup startups get like all the press. They're the sexy thing that you hear about, but they're freaking hard, right? And most of them fail. As a matter of fact, if you look at the stats, the best that you've got is basically a 70% chance of failure if you've done it before successfully, right? I don't really like those odds. It's only a 2% failure rate with acquisitions. Only a 2% failure rate with acquisitions. So because the companies are already existing, they're already doing well. They already have less risk because they've got more customers, excuse me, they have instant customers, they've got instant employees, instant systems, all of the things that you need to make a business go, they've got. You don't have to figure it all out. I get to interview uh, Chip Wilson this afternoon who founded Lululemon, and I've spent a whole lot of time researching Chip and a bunch of other entrepreneurs as I have interviewed them, and they're all like, man, it was so hard getting started. Every day I felt like I was about to lose everything. And many of them do, right? That's why the failure rate is so high. A lot of them are just lucky and they'll tell you, right? Phil Knight will tell you with Nike, he says, I just kind of got lucky again and again and again. Okay, well, Phil, maybe you actually knew what you're doing a little bit, but it is true. Luck plays a huge factor, but you take a lot of the roll of the dice out of it when you get a business that's already got all of the things that you want your business to have, right? And because it's so hard to make things work, 600,000 businesses roughly a year in the United States alone simply close their doors, right? And there's a lot of reasons. It might be that there's not enough money. It might be that they have challenges with their partners, that they're getting a divorce, that they want to relocate to a different place, um, health, death, uh, the ultimate exit, right? Um, they're having challenges with their partners. A lot of times I'll go into deals where people were having challenges with their partners, health, divorce, lots and lots of reasons that this happens, right? Well, what this is, is this is a very, very valuable list because this tells you exactly who a motivated seller is. Just like in real estate where you can get great deals on houses from motivated sellers, you want in the business world to find a motivated seller because if you would like to not have to just stroke a big check to buy their business, this is who you want to deal with. And there are literally millions of them, millions of them. And more because COVID has made things harder for a lot of people, right? You guys are blessed because you have all of the knowledge and skills of how to find traffic and to convert it. Most of these people absolutely suck at that, right? 
So the market is really huge. If you look globally, on, there's a total number of SMBs or SMB, SMEs, that's small and medium-sized business or small and medium-sized enterprise. There are millions and millions and millions of them. And at any given time, there's roughly 4.3 million or so of those that are for sale. And remember, most of them aren't going to sell. We know just in listed businesses that 80% won't sell. So in these territories alone, you're talking about almost 4 million businesses at any given time that are available for you to acquire, right? So I think it's the best time right now to acquire at prices because of all of these things. So here are the five steps, and this is a very abbreviated version of this, but it is complete enough for you to do this yourselves, okay? So the five steps are to position yourself as an investor who sits off of the organization chart, okay? I am famous for saying, I won't be on the org chart, right? I live off the org chart. If you're on the org chart, you have a job. Determine your acquisition criteria so that you decide what you want to buy because if you don't know what it is, it's gonna be a lot harder to find. And then find motivated sellers, motivated sellers. This means not business broker represented, not investment banker represented people, right? People that fit those 10 things that I showed you just a second ago. And that's deal flow, right? Then gather your data and analyze it and see if the thing makes sense and then go forward and achieve growth and build wealth, right? Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about these. By the way, I wanna make a clarifying point. I talk about OOP as no money out of pocket, no OOP, right? So no money out of pocket does not mean that we are paying business, that we're paying nothing for the business because we're always paying fair value. And it doesn't mean nothing down because nothing down means that there's no money that's going to be paid up front. Very often we'll pay a whole bunch of money up front, it's just not ours. It's not coming out of our pocket, okay? We like businesses that buy themselves. So the first thing is position yourself off of the org chart, right, and as an investor. So I call this the O-Myth, so if, you, uh, if, if uh, Mr. Gerbers and his people are here, uh, does, I, I'm just, nobody, okay. Um, anyway, uh, copyrights, it's just a concept. Um, the O-Myth to me is that in his book, Gerber talk, the E-Myth, uh, Gerber talks about hey, look, you know, don't sweep the, don't we work on the business and sweep the floors and change the coffee machines and all those kinds of things. You should work on it. So to me, it's, the on is a myth as well. Because while it's great for you to build systems and all that stuff, you're still selling the service or the widget that the business sells. And my suggestion to you is that where the real money is, where the real money is, is to work above the business if you work above the business, then you're focused on selling the business as the thing that you sell, not the product or service that the business sells. It's kind of meta, right? It's like, let's take a step up and say, we can hire people to do all that other stuff. We know what those people get paid, right? What I haven't seen is a pay schedule for somebody who's finding the investors and diversifying into new territories and actually being an entrepreneur. You know why? Because you don't want that person working for you. And that person will not work for you, right? Work above the business and do the big things where the business is the thing you're trying to figure out, how can I sell that, okay? Um, and then be the thing they want the most. Most businesses think that they want cash, right? And so if you approach businesses and say, hey, can I buy your business? Some people might say yes, but many will say no that ultimately would say yes if you approach them a little bit differently. If you approach them as an investor, then they're going to be more interested because they think they need an investor to put cash in the company, either to buy it or to infuse it with cash, right? So we're not going to be playing with at least our cash. So it's important for you to understand an investor is any person that commits capital, right? So what's capital? Capital is anything that confers value or benefit. So all of you, just by virtue of being here, have huge value that you can confer on businesses. You can help them get traffic and you can help them convert it. And you probably know some other things too, okay? So don't kid yourself or don't cheat yourself by saying, I'm not an investor. Say, I am an investor and then position yourself across wherever you sit in social or out in the world as an investor on your social media. It's a huge step mentally. It's like, I'm an investor, I'm not an attorney, a media buyer, a, a copywriter. I'm a freaking investor, right? And I tell the world that because as you do that more, more and more deal flow will come your way, right? The next thing is figure out what the heck am I gonna buy? 
So I think that deciding what type of business to acquire can be really, really frustrating, and I watch it hold a lot of people back. So I have a little, um, couple little tools for you to think about. One is, if you're thinking about what is the low profit, high profit opportunity on one axis, and what is the low effort, high effort uh, axis on the other axis, then you really end up with four kinds of deals. The one that is the least exciting, I think, is passive. You can make a ton of money. I have lots of friends who have tens of millions of dollars a year they make with passive businesses, okay? But it's a lower profit margin for effort. It's a lower return on equity. It's a lower return on assets than a lot of the other things you can do. Also have a lot of friends who are willing to exert a little bit more effort and have a lifestyle business. But where I've found the greatest profit to be is either acquiring these businesses and then selling them to somebody else. Effectively, it's, uh, it's flip this house for businesses, right? You can find them, they're run down, most people don't know how to do it. You can slap a coat of paint on those businesses and they will sell for a whole lot more money, right? So lower effort and higher profit. And of course, what Ryan's going to be talking about much more in the session immediately after this one is if you're, going, if you're willing to put a little bit more effort in, then the big profit is just to take these things and scale them up. And also, you can even smash them together. So as far as what you might want to buy, um, I just say take an inventory of the things that you are interested in. Everybody who's successful will tell you, pursue your passion. That is part of the equation, because entrepreneurship's freaking hard, right? And if you don't have something that you actually like doing, then you're probably not going to stick with it if the going gets really hard. So if, it, if you start with the huge advantage of it being something that you care about and that you're actually passionate about, that's a good thing. The second thing would be say, what, what are the experiences? What things do I have experience in? And then what are my superpowers and skills? I might have experience as an attorney, but I might be a crappy attorney, right? I might have experience as a media buyer, but kind of can't ever seem to get that equation to balance in the right way. So your superpowers and skills and experiences are different. And then last but not least, where do you have connections in the network? Like where do you have a network that you can connect with that will drive deal flow or allow you to make the things that you're doing more profitable? So for me, I just fill it out and I'm like, okay, well, I'm good at, at these things and this is my superpowers, my experience, my businesses. And then I just start circling the things that I like, right? So real estate investing, remodeling, investing generally. I'm good at buying and selling businesses and creating and running events and writing books and courses uh, and so on and so forth. And then that guides me. And then I'll make my list of this is what I should probably think about buying because I have a huge advantage, right? This is something I like, I have experience at, I'm good at it, and I probably know some people. So it makes it a whole lot easier to do deals, okay? So then you decide how much money do you want to pay yourself. This is important because this is going to tell you what's the size of the business that you want to work with, right? What, what size of business do I want to acquire? Well, businesses make profit if, if you're lucky, right? And that's what we're after. So we want a business that's going to pay us some income for our time. So let's say it's the most common thing that anybody tells me, I want to make an extra $10,000 a month. Great, it's 120 grand a year, okay? Now, you're also going to want to grow the business. And because you come here and you already have the skills of knowing how to grow things, then you have to figure out what's your budget. Let's say that's another $10,000 a month. Now, obviously, if you're spending $10,000 a month and getting it back 30 or 60 or 90 days later, you know, you don't need a full 120, but you probably also want to scale, okay? So my target EBITDA is going to be to add those things together. EBITDA stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. It's basically profit, okay? So the profit I need is how much money do I want to pay myself? plus how much do I need to grow the business? Then you just want to figure out what is the multiple that these businesses are selling at. And there's lots of places to find out what those are going for. On average, you'll find that most of the businesses that you will be interested in would sell between one and five times their profit. So we multiply our profit that we need to grow and have money for ourselves times the multiple. That gives me my target price is gonna be between pretty wide range, 240,000 and 1.2 million. But now I know the size, and I know the industry, and I've got an advantage from the four things that I got from the first week worksheet, right? So then you're gonna choose a category that you're going to acquire. So this is what I talked about at the beginning, just presented a little bit different way. Do I want 
leads, which I will get from media. Do I want infrastructure? Do I want to increase average order value? Do I want to increase lifetime customer value? Do I want to increase margin? Or um, do I want to get some IP? Okay. And so I just go through here and write down all of these. And I would take a picture of this because these are, this is a very good summary of all of the kinds of things that you might buy in each of these categories. So the first time I go through this thing I call the acquisition wheel, I've identified all the categories of things I want to buy. Then I'd put that aside and do it again and say, now for each category, what company might be interesting to me, right? You will never run out of ideas for what to acquire using the acquisition wheel. Then you're going to find motivated sellers that have the challenges that we talked about before, right? The 10 challenges or so, I think there's 10, right? Yeah, the 10 challenges that we talked about before that meet the size criteria and that meet the four skills, passions, experience, connections, right? The best businesses, though, are not for sale. So don't go to a broker. You might want to go to Biz Buy Sell and some of the other things, other sites that do this. Those are generally, unless they are uh, FISBO for sale by owner businesses, those are generally not the best place to find them. They are good for practicing. Um, so I, I would recommend you go and kind of look at them. To find the deals that aren't for sale or what we call unlisted M&As, use the acquisition wheel that I just gave you. You can also query your social network. We get deals all the time just from posting, we're looking for a company that does blank. Does anybody know, does anybody know? Not you have to own it, but do you know somebody that owns a company that's like this that might be interested in selling, okay? Or might be interested in an investment is even a broader ask. Check the expired business broker listings. That's uh, a source. Check the FISBO, the for sale by owners on the sites like Biz Buy Sell. And then I'll give you 29 more sources you can just take the picture of because I don't have enough time to explain them all, but they're pretty self-explanatory. Um, the acquisition wheel we talked about. Um, to give you a couple of examples for Digital Marketer, Digital Marketer wanted more market share. We wanted to go up market. We wanted to go to enterprise customers, but not the SMB, the small and medium sized business customers that Digital Marketer normally focuses on. So what we did was we bought the Online Marketing Institute, which had those kinds of clients. We just acquired it, right? And uh, that was actually started in bankruptcy court, believe it or not. Um, we, it was in bankruptcy court at a bankruptcy auction. I flew to San Francisco, went through the whole process, didn't win the auction. The people that won the auction paid too much for it. We knew that, we stopped bidding, and, um, but walked over and talked to them and said, hey man, if things don't work out, let's stay in touch, and if there's anything we can do to help you, you know, love to do it. We bought it for about, God, I think we ended up at about um, 16, so what is that, 84% less than they paid for it a year later. And again, no money out of pocket, right? So, um, so it's good to stick with these. We bought a Facebook group for our uh, dog products company called uh, Dachshund, Dachshund, Dachshund Love, um, which to me is kind of a sketchy name, but, um, but, uh, but it, it is lovers of, uh, of that breed of dog. And we instantly had, I think it was 177,000 in there. We buy all these Facebook groups and other media because they've already aggregated the attention and eyeballs of a dachshund lover. So we can direct all of our marketing efforts so specifically without cookies that Google may or may not kill by 2023, right? Without retargeting that Facebook might allow, might not, without third-party cookies. Well, all, all the stuff that is a challenge to us as marketers right now, we just own the media. So now we know that they're dachshund lovers and how do we know that? Well, because they kind of self-identify and now we own that media, right? Um, for our dev team, we bought, we've bought a lot of software companies. True Conversion's the one I always talk about, and just because it was a complicated deal that wasn't complicated. It sounds complicated. It was a, uh, I haven't messed it up. I think it was a UK, it was a uh, Dutch citizen living in the UK. The company was in Pakistan, owned by a Hong Kong corporation. We had to vet them against the terrorist list before we could send money. It was kind of interesting uh, deal but it took about a week to put together, okay? So these don't, it, even if they sound complicated, they're not. Um, Prime Corporate Services is a company that allowed us to increase our average order value because in all of our teachings, we're helping businesses to grow or to acquire other businesses or to have an operating system or to market. But all of those businesses need to have the appropriate entities to work in. So we're able to sell them additional products now that we have an ownership interest in a company that does corporate formation and credit building and all those kinds of things. 
When we wanted to increase lifetime customer value by having recurring revenue, we acquired a company that's a webinar company called Event, right? It's called A Event. I, I don't know, that, like branding wise, that just makes me, that gives me pain just to say it. I, I, I say that to Ryan just because Ryan's OCD about things. I'm like, so how about A Event? He's like, and, and Event. Um, but that gave us recurring revenue, right? When we wanted to have additional margin in our dog manufacturing business, we acquired a company that had end user connections in that industry. We basically bought our distributor, okay? We bought our distributor. And then when we wanted to launch a new website that had all kinds of cool how-to stuff in it, we looked at the cost that it was gonna be to create that stuff and we said, this is gonna cost us at least a million bucks. Let's just go find somebody that's already got it. We ended up buying it for $30,000, no money out of pocket over a year payment uh, that had 128 different categories of courses and trainings and software already built out, okay? Um, Biz Buy Sell is probably the most popular site that you can look at, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, uh, mind you looking there, but just don't do deals with brokers, please. And if you're in the UK, uh, businesses for sale is a good place to look as well. And then if you wanna just, these are, to me, they're, they're some obvious like friends and family, but you would be amazed how many deals come through friends and family and employees and contractors and masterminds and things like that. Um, there's 29 deal sources here. I just take a picture of it. If you're trying to say, well, where the heck am I gonna get deal flow? This is it. This is kind of where it is for everybody. Um, you can do cold outreach to companies. You can do digital marketing campaigns that, that market to people on, um, and, and throw them into a funnel, but I find that that's really hard compared to doing it this way. This is just so much easier. We do, we do use direct mail. We've had lots of success with direct mail, just, just getting a list and then sending it to every digital marketing agency in Minneapolis, St. Paul, saying that we're interested in acquiring a company, and then we, we end up acquiring companies that way as well. So then how do you find who to contact? Because you want to talk to the owner, right? You want to talk to the person that has the ability to make the decisions. So um, you can call them and ask, that's the easiest. Um, you can check Zoom info uh, about us, who is uh, SEC states, if you're in the United States, uh, is an aggregation of all the Secretary of States. Secretary of States where business entities are formed. If you pull up the company on the SEC states site, it will list the officers and directors. For most small companies, those are the owners, okay? And then in the UK, you can go um, and look on Companies House or, or, or places like that. It is a numbers game. As you get started, you will find that for, you know, say every 100 or so outreaches that you have, you'll have a certain number of responses. Usually it's about 60%. Then some of those will turn into a conversation. You will make an offer on a few of those and then end up having one or two deals, right? But as you do this more and more, the deal flow will come much, much warmer to you. And you'll find that every deal is a potential acquisition that you just decide if you want or not. That's kind of what, where I am right now, right? But that that's, doesn't take long to happen, okay? And um, then we gather the data and analyze the deal. So here's, here's the thing to think about is, is the price that they're asking reasonable? There's a whole lot of published multiples that are out there. If you Google multiple digital marketing business, multiple or sales multiple for plumbing business, you'll probably find good researched answers for free that will give you guidelines. There are also sheets of uh, Equidam, E-Q-U-I-D-A-M, and the Stern School of Business at New York University publish data on, um, and Pepperdine does too, publish data on uh, what multiples different categories of businesses and different industries sell at. You can look at those, but those are bigger deals. So divide by four to find out what the multiple for a smaller deal is. And um, then you're just gonna say, is what they're asking reasonable? And then rather than asking for financial statements, which typically will put walls up and cause people to say, you need to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, um, I just say, hey, I'm gonna need a little bit of information to see what the best way is to work together. And then I use this as a sheet. I don't give it to them, because again, that's scary for them. I just, this is my thing to gather information to decide um, how can I structure this in a way that makes sense. This is a copy of the, um, and you can go online to equidam.com and get this. Um, but this is just a copy of the 2021 multiples in a bunch of different businesses. So like I said, in these I divide by four to see if the price is reasonable. And then you're gonna fund it, preferably with no money out of pocket. I call that the deal stack. 
to show you a few of the ways to do that. I have hundreds because I've been doing this for a long time, but I want this to be complete. So I'm going to explain five of them to you before we leave. Okay. And the five are the easiest is choose the things that you want to buy and don't buy the things that you don't. Okay. That's called a carve out. So let's say that the business is a manufacturing company and they manufacture widgets, but, uh, and this is based on a story that, uh, that Perry told me, uh, but let's say that the owner has always had a fascination with candy manufacturing machines, and so the owner has assembled a warehouse full of brand new candy manufacturing machines that have never been used. He just likes to walk through and pet them every so often, right? True story. Um, so when you go to buy that company, you don't want the candy machines. You want the machines that make the widgets. There may be several assets that are on the list that I gave you that you don't need. Maybe you don't need all the cash, and that will, that will save you some money. Maybe you don't need the accounts receivable, and that will save you some money. Maybe you don't need all the inventory. Maybe they're selling six different SKUs, and you only want to buy one, right? Maybe you only want to buy the Amazon listing. There's a, maybe you only care about the e-commerce store. There's a, a million ways to slice companies up, and you can really get the price down by slicing it up. Okay, so carve out everything that you don't want, that will reduce the purchase price. The next thing you can do is look to credit card reserves. When I came into Digital Marketer, Digital Marketer had, as I recall, I don't know if Ryan's still here or not, but about $2 million, was it 2 million, right? Of reserves on credit cards? Yeah, yeah. That was just a hidden asset, right? That they forgot about because they're busy doing stuff. That means that when you acquire that company that's got those reserves, you can negotiate and have them released. Don't negotiate or tell them before, right? Because then they'll just take that money. But the truth is, is that most people never negotiate anything. They just accept whatever is going on. So they have these reserves that build and build and build. And even if they're released on a rolling basis of six months or 12 months or something like that, you can go in and we have zero reserves now, zero, right? That is possible. So if you're looking for quick money for yourself, even if you don't want to buy anything, go get your freaking reserves back, right? But they're also a fantastic source of money that the company doesn't realize it has that you can use to help acquire and pay for it. You can also ask the owner to sell or finance. So typically I'll ask for an 80% owner finance. And sometimes I get that, sometimes I don't, right? But I start at 80% and if I end up at 40%, that just means that rather than going to a bank or uh, putting personal guarantees on loans and things like that, the seller of the business is just like, yeah, I'll take money over time, right? Then you can use integrator equity. So I mentioned that I like for you to think about working above the business, working above the business means that you are not working on it or in it, okay? So that means you need somebody who's gonna be working on it and in it. That's in uh, Gino Wickman's, I think, parlance is uh, integrators versus visionaries, you being the visionary, they're being the integrators. Offer the people who are, like, let's say that number one, the owner is gonna stay. They just don't wanna be an owner anymore. Does that ever happen? Yes, it does. It happens quite a bit. The owner just says, I want, a, I want chips off the table so I can get some cash and I don't want to have to be an entrepreneur anymore. I just want to be able to do the thing I like doing. Fantastic. Stay in the business and let's have you work in the business so I don't have to operate it. But when I'm looking for money, and maybe that's a partial sale. So your integrator equity there would be, I'll buy 80% of the business. We still are in Traffic and Conversion Summit. We sold 80% to Clarion and Blackstone, right? But we're still here, right? but we also got a whole bunch of money. That's cool, win-win, right? So if you want to, um, to, to negotiate a partial sale, you can do that. You can also go to the people, let's say the owner says, absolutely not, I want out. Then you just go to the number two, three, four people who are probably running the company anyway and have all of the tribal knowledge the company has. And you say, have you ever thought maybe being an owner? And then give them the opportunity to invest. Let's say I buy a million dollar business and the owner's willing to finance 80%. So I need $200,000. Well, if I went to the president or manager or chief operating officer or whoever, and maybe the chief marketing officer or the chief financial officer or the accountant, right? One of the companies I bought, I did this. And, um, uh, and basically, those people pay 
to buy 10%, let's say each. So I got a million dollar sale. I have $800,000 taken care of through financing with the seller. I gotta have $200,000 more. So I simply give the other two people there the ability to invest. Now I've got my down payment, my deal is done, they're vested, I got people to run the company, they have a vested interest, they have skin in the game. Again, win, win, win. And then last but not least would be an earnout. An earnout says, and we did this on the sale of TNC as well, by the way, um, just to show that we do use all this stuff. The uh, earnout says, hey, I can't, I can't agree to pay you, you as the buyer, I can't agree to pay you all of this right now because I don't know if it's going to continue to make as much money as, as it has been or as much as you say it's gonna in the future. Um, so let's just agree on a formula that says, if sales are X or profits are X or these customers stay for two years or whatever you want it to be, conditions, then I'll pay you a, a, an additional amount of money later. That means you have to come up with less upfront and you let the business pay for itself out of its profits and growth. So earnouts typically go between one and four years and they're typically between 10 and 40% of the total purchase price, okay? So there's a lot, like up to 40%, within the mainstream of businesses and deals that get done that you can do through, through an earnout, And that is how you acquire with no money out of pocket. If you want a lot of additional really cool stuff, I've got a whole channel full of it and you should subscribe so that you don't miss any of it. I'm uploading videos all the time. There's a lot of things that are changing in this area and you don't want to miss out. You don't want to do it wrong and you don't want to make the mistakes I make. Subscribe so that you don't miss out and then check out this next video.